Welcome to the Smart Nonsense Podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, and challenging norms. You, you think that intro is ever going to get old? Uh, I don't even. I don't even think it's appropriate. I mean, the the real intro is we make nerdy stuff cool, but I just run the script, dude. That's all I do. You interpret no, what it means good. means nothing to me, but I like the sound of it. It's a uh, good cadence. I Bell was just. Wait, 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 really quick. You know I was what? just. Re- oh, am I on the lag? Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Hey, I'll be back in a second. How about that? Wouldn't wouldn't be a Friday episode if I didn't lag switch right out from the start. Nice, nice. You, you're back on. You, you got good time. You want to tell me about the thing you were gonna say or no? Oh yeah, I was just rewatching uh, my niece Amelia's book she wrote for her mother, and um, yeah, they're in Wisconsin, so so she had access to a hunting magazine that she was making a scrapbook out of, and man. A lot of dead deer in this book for a five-year-old. A yeah. lot of dead deer. I don't know if we do B-roll, but um, imagine that. Your five-year-old comes home with an authored scrapbook, and it's just deer in snares. I I love, too, how it's uh, addressed. It's like for her, the mom, and then it starts in the back, and you're like, oh, this is kind of fun and interesting. First picture is just a gutted deer. Or not gutted, <laughs> but fucking slaughtered deer. And you're like, huh, maybe that's too young. Maybe not. If we were natives, this would be normal starting at birth. So it's like, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, Hunter-gatherer Wisconsinites. Yeah, that's what happens when you move out west. Uh, Belky, here's here's what's crazy to me. Uh, a lot of things in my life are crazy to me. One Yesterday, you texted me, and we kind of kept it secret for the pod because we didn't want to put the horse before the cart before the horse before the cart. But what that it should be cart before the horse, but I just repeated it twice, so it double canceled. The problem is, uh, there is no problem because we got invited one year after we made our video for this human being. We got invited to their fiftieth birthday party. Fiftieth, baby boy. I really can't speak when I'm excited. It gets tough to like. Isn't that you ever, nuts though? You're consciously, you're consciously thinking about yourself speaking, and then you can't speak, and it just the you get your own internal lag switch. It's really well, because, tough because, like on a pod like this, or when you're entertaining, you're trying to like quickly improv script something on the fly, and so you can get yeah, you can get jammed up in there. You can get jammed up in there for sure. Yeah, See, on the vlog, sticky. I just do another take. We don't edit this. No. If we did have to edit this, I don't think I'd ever release a podcast because I'd be like, <laughs> I, I just stuttered. I can't release that. But a year ago, to the day, uh, today is May 20th. Yesterday was May 19th. May 19th, 2021, you released a video. I forget the title. Something like David Sachs, My Daddy. Or like yeah. something like that. And it like the thumbnail is you putting your head through a burning, I don't know, sheet of paper that has sacks. Hey, if we do B roll, it'll be here. But uh, to the day, one year later, from going from unknown human people, Henry Dillon, now Sacks and his wife are inviting us, specifically you, because I think she wants to play around with you a little bit on his birthday. <laughs> Might be swinging to Cabo for his You're gonna get birthday. us uninvited. One day not later. if this gets released a, a couple days after. Uh, no, there's not a chance they're going to watch that. But that was the crazy thing to me to to essentially go from unknown to the most private friends and family invite only event in a year. It's to insane. With the day, literally, you sent me the literally vlog. to the day, May nineteenth, twenty twenty one. We were pitching the All In podcast on my vlog with some clips to the day she emailed and and what was so crazy about it is we were wrapping up the summit and i think today we're going to talk about all in summit day two um and we were talking to jason calacanis's nephew It was like 1 a.m uh, we were out grabbing drinks and he was like yeah we were at dinner today and you know jackie Sachs, she was just talking about how much she loves the work you've done for david and like this that or the other and it's kind of an operator 
I always I always try to like note everything so that like nothing misses our filter. So I wrote down when we got back that night, like um, hit up Jackie Sachs at some point for clips because I think she has a show of her own. Like maybe we can do some video work for her. She likes us. She likes what David does. The next morning, she emailed us. You know, I didn't have to hit the to-do list to to ping Jackie Sachs for clips. She hit us the next morning, a year to the day. And you didn't even... we started doing this. You didn't meet her. I didn't meet her at the event, right? You didn't... She's just lurking. And she's like, hey, this guy cares about Sachs. I don't know if they think we're making the clips ourselves. And maybe it's more personal. Pity. We're like... (laughs) I don't know. You like the clips. We like the clips. Let's keep doing it. Why not? Uh, well, yeah, it was. A, and I think I'll talk to them today. I didn't connect with her yesterday. Their their chief of staff just texted me. Um, family chief of staff. Family chief of staff. And actually, David's chief of staff hit me up yesterday. Like, I hope you guys can attend. Um, we'll talk <laughs> after. But I don't know. It was It was like a cryptic email. I think one, it's like they want us to go. She wants us to be in the circle. She's like, I like putting smart people together. I she even said, like, I like your work just outside of what you've done for David. So I don't really <laughs> right. know what she's talking about specifically, but like I think it's twofold. They want us there and want to be closer as French fr- French, which is dude, I got the lag. It's which tough, is crazy. Dude, watch the lag. Which is crazy. And then I think they want us to do some video work for the uh, birthday party as well, which is pretty exciting. I think it's exciting because for what it's w- worth, the parallel is Casey Neistat got his start with his brother doing like a 50th birthday party, this crazy video for some famous New York artist. And, you know, like Bill Clinton was in the audience. All these bigwigs were in the audience. And it's like, oh, these stars, they're aligning in really right. weird ways. Well, that was... The the last party, it was 80s night, and I crossed paths with Sawhill. I don't even know his last name. Uh, Lavingia, A L A V I N G I A. Yeah, he wrote the minimalist that. entrepreneur. Right, that's the title. Fuck, I forget. I, I read like half of yep. it and then stopped. Founder but, uh, of Gumroad. Basically, early uh, right. developer on Pinterest mobile app. Pretty big dude. He, I mean, we were talking, and his his company. Uh, got an offer for $150 million and he owns the majority of it. But he's like, nah, I think it's worth more. So he didn't sell. So he's he's like pretty successful. But talking to him, he's like, hey, these events are cool and all, but really you don't want to be at paid events. Like If you're paying to be there, there's always going to be like, you're paying for access. There's the VIP. You're just one of the people that paid again. You're, you're never, you can't pay to get in the circle, basically. Do you, what you want to do is get the invite to just this exclusive event. And now it's like, oh, wait, this was literally the day after I talked to Sawhill. We get the invite to the exclusive event, and you can't pay to go to Sax's birthday, no matter how much money you have. It's like, oh, wow. This gets back to kind of, I think I texted you, or maybe I wrote it in my notes, but I'm like, our philosophy was just figure out how to be the best in the world at something, where there, there is no competition. It's Peter Thiel, like, go where people are not. No one was doing insanely animated, over-the-top, uh, Balenciaga runway type clips on Twitter because it's just a text-only platform. We come in and we're too stupid, so we start making really awesome clips there. They get noticed. Then you stack being the best with doing it for free for important people, and then a year later, you get invited to the birthday party. Can I just add on that too stupid front? This is where, like... I think novices go really far. You kind of have to be stupid to start. People were telling us, like, don't make video for Twitter. It wasn't made for that. What do we do? We just start on Twitter. We went straight to the top on Twitter. We're just, like, too dumb to do anything else. We still haven't really figured out YouTube, the video platform, and TikTok. We went to the thing that everybody else... And you kind of have to do that. Otherwise, you're just going to be everything else. We're going to transition into the summit with this beautiful switch. Talking about like being too stupid, probably one of the dumbest decisions like 10, 15 years ago was to get into virtual reality because no one was doing it. And it's just like there were a bunch of failed attempts because you these super heavy headsets with crappy technology. No one wanted to do it except this guy, Palmer Lucky, who's literally like 14 years old. He, he got into video games and he had like six screens. And he's like, 
I don't think the world is going to get better by just adding more screens to make a, a more immersive environment. Luke, Luke keeps calling me and I've been fucking ignoring it. I need to call him back. What's he want? But I don't know, dude. Uh, okay. So you can't add more screens. Like what fundamentally has to change to make the experience better is just getting the VR goggles. So he starts tinkering around and he's, he's playing. And he's like, all right, well, the problem is everyone in the past is designing it where there isn't software or good software. So he's like, instead of having these huge bulky headsets, let's just do as much as possible in the software. So instead of doing anything optical with the, I don't know, the lenses and the screens and stuff like that, it's all through the software because that doesn't weigh anything. And then just the very minimal like strap on your head and, and like bare minimum screen, it's going to get you there. So uh, by 21, he ends up selling this to Facebook for $2 billion. And this is Oculus. Right. This is Oculus. Oculus VR. Sells. Uh, so now he goes to, uh, work at Facebook. There's some controversy, which we'll talk about. Uh, he gets fired then starts a new company called, uh, Anduril. Am I pronouncing it right? Anduril or Arduil? It's, it's the sword from, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or something. Uh, that's, that's what, uh, nerdy people do, but he gets into that and now it's this defense company. And so. Uh, I actually want to do a whole podcast on him because I'm obsessed with him. Uh, you'll see why in a second. But he starts this defense company, and everyone in tech really wants to stay away from defense. It's like barring SpaceX and Palantir, which are the only two unicorns at the time in Department of Defense, uh, or new unicorns, no one wants to touch it. But he comes in and he's like, there's a huge need. Like deterrence, keeping people away by just making sure U.S. is the superpower because we have a lot better morals, even though sometimes they're not the best. But like, on average, would you rather have Russia or China running the world or U.S.? Clearly, the U.S. Like, we get most things right. Uh, so he he said something really that. interesting, or yeah. was it him or someone else about war? It's like nations go to war when there is a perceived um, imbalance in what their powers can do. Right? right. So if China, if China thinks like our AI, which it is, is a hundred times better than the U.S., they will engage in war with us because they know they can win. Right. Wars do not get engaged in when two two countries believe you know their their power is is roughly equal, which is kind of counterintuitive. Wait, wait. Because if their countries don't what? engage in war when they don't know who is a more powerful, no, which Really? Picture it this way, all right? Uh, well, I am i don't know if I'm understanding you right, but basically, like, say, I don't know, Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan's like, I want to fight you, Henry. Are you going to fight Jackie Chan? Probably not, because you know he'd kick your ass. But if it's like, Correct. oh, I'm going to fight you, it's like, okay, we're probably about equal. If If there's something important on the line, like I just stole a lot of money from you, you would probably fight me. That's reasonable because it's like, oh, we're probably about the same level. There's a chance I'd win versus there's no chance in the world you're going to beat Jackie Chan. So you don't even engage. That's a deterrence. Um, I guess. On the flip side, though, if you're Jackie Chan, you're China, you you may engage to take over that nation. It's kind of what Russia's doing in Ukraine right now, or so they think. I'm saying... But yeah, it could go either I, way. I'm saying the person... They wouldn't fight back. They'd just go for a truce if you know you're going to lose. Correct. Ukraine is correct, fighting correct. back because they know there's a chance they can win. Correct. Otherwise, you'd just be like, let me just sign the treaties. You're going to smash me. It's not even worth killing all my people for this. Correct. So his whole point as a company is like uh, our technology, like he says this and it's the most beautiful example to me. He's like, look at a John Deere tractor today. The technology in that tractor is more advanced than anything our military has. Oh my God, dude. I can't speak a sentence. One more really? time. One more time. One more time. <laughs> Look at such a John a Deere line. tractor today. No, dude. Oh. I'll do it for you. A John Deere tractor has better <laughs> autonomy and AI than anything in our Department of Defense today. I almost lost it, dude. I almost lost it on defense. So think about that. There's been more innovation in tractors than the stuff on our uh, in our battlefields. And he gets into the reason. It's like, 
he kind of, well, I don't know if this is in podcast, but I, I don't know. I want to save, I want to save a lot about him. I want to just want to tell his whole story in a non-starter. Dude. <laughs> podcast, dude. Stuttery? Don't get in your I'm head so now. in my head now. I'm so in Don't my head. Don't get in your head now. Um, uh, where were you? I'll take it, Pop. I'll take it from here. No, but I dude, can't he's just where he's doing were. a great job with his company. Everyone's stoked. It's like, okay. Uh his, oh, his yeah, talk th- was titled The What is it? The current thing. The current thing. The, the reason the Department of, of Defense is so behind is for a lot of reasons politics bureaucracy in bad incentives um just a ton of things i mean yeah he was like we're still using weapons from the 80s the things we ship to ukraine are weapons from the 80s well his whole point is like we're waiting for a ukraine war to suddenly care about defense it's like that's not what defense is for it's for prevention not last minute you're like oh shit we really need technology and then you just get destroyed that's not how it works so there's like there's a couple areas that are like this it's climate change you got to make sure to do it preventatively same thing with economy do it preventatively like make sure you're not getting fucked and then here in defense it's like okay that's why i want to spread this because we can't rely on when a ukraine happens and we suddenly we're like oh this is the thing to think about we prepare but it's too late and then it goes out of Twitter sphere in I don't know, a couple months, and now we're like fucked again. Uh, he's like, "This is the ongoing process we need to care about, and we need the best people there." The problem is, uh, people are scared to get into it uh, because if you go like patriotism is kind of a bad thing right now. Like, you would be seen as weird, at least in like coastal communities, smart communities, if you're like going around with a big red, red, white, and blue flag. People just don't want that. Um, so there's a weird stigma. But uh, that's going to end up fucking us. So he's, he's kind of evangelizing like, hey, it doesn't like doesn't mean you're going to be murdering people for wrong. I guess it comes from a mistrust of the government. Like you don't want to build tools from them. But they're not even building attacking tools. They're building like defensive uh, drones. So like counter drone and sentry software. So it's like you ever play Call of Duty and you see on – the mini map, like there's radar on and you can see all the buildings and like where people are. He's literally trying to build that for the US government. It's like, okay, that's that's awesome. And that's cool. You, you got to get behind that. Um, so all of this and uh, the big, I guess, uh, how do we do on transition? Basically, he gives a great presentation. Right? Everyone's great, like, so yeah, I, yeah, I've never heard his name before. Um, watching his presentation, I was like energized about this thing I've never been energized about. Great, oh, great presentation on why this matters, why the current thing is the most important thing. But actually, when it comes to defense, why the current thing, it may be too late. So for all these reasons, you're talking about prevention. What you kind of there's a couple of signs, you know, you can trust someone. Uh, one is when they speak their Watch mind on something with the 10 out of 10. What? Watch it with the 10 out of 10, the signs. Hey, come on. No inside jokes. Now I know what it's like as an audience member to watch this. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? Uh, I, 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 I know the joke. I even got, um, dude, I'm also rattled. <laughs> my niece was running around this, and I was trying to kick her out, and she just kept banging on the door. I'm like, I got to do work, but work don't exist when you're three, four, whatever she is. Um, Games. Dead deers. Oh, hey, okay. So, how do you trust, trust someone? One is God. I really just don't want to shoot a fucking podcast right now. I don't know why I'm. I'm like, Focus. I'm feeling Palmer angry. Um. Okay, so you trust someone one because they just say something that goes against the grain. Like if you go against the current thing, like he's like, hey, defense is important, military is important. Most people in tech is they're too scared to say that. It's much safer to say like, oh, the U.S. is bad. We commit war crimes. It's like. That's easy to say. It's like, sure, we do, but like, look, bigger picture. Like, don't be dumb. So he's going against the grain. You're like, okay, I trust this guy because he's clearly taking a risk with his reputation. So it must be true, at least to him. Number two is when you wear flip flops to a conference. Like, this (laughs) dude comes in, Hawaiian shirt, flip flops, nothing tucked. He's like, got a goatee. It's like, okay, this guy clearly doesn't care what we think about him. He's just 
doing what's most comfortable for him. I'm like, okay, I respect that. So instantly I'm like, okay, I trust this guy. Then the third reason is what he transitions into because <sighs> he finishes his whole presentation. He's like, I just got one last thing. And presentation is like over. He pulls out his phone. And now he's like, <sighs> a few years ago, I was kicked out of my baby. I created Oculus from the ground up. I think it's the most amazing technology in the world. I would be working on it till the day I die because I think that is the future. That is where we live. Once you experience it, you cannot unsee it. And I want to be working on that until the day I die. But I couldn't because a few years ago, I made an anti-Hillary contribution of $9,000 for a billboard. When I put that out there, the whole world attacked me. One of the top people attacking me was Jason Calacanis. He just starts listing. He's like, Jason said, uh, Palmer is stupid. This would never work. Why are you contributing to this terrible person? Uh, his family, no one wants him in the world. Like literally reading like 20 tweets from Jason over time, just hitting a founder when he's down. Literally just contributes to him getting fired from Facebook uh, because of this contribution to someone that wasn't the, the current thing and and the room went from like chuckles when he first started to deftly silent silent right. it was like the most eerie thing because jason is backstage he is publicly calling out the creator of this event for right. for smearing him as a founder Oof, he's like and you could feel this because he built up like Oculus was my life. I see it as the future. And we even experienced this a little bit after with AR. It wasn't even VR. But we saw there was this one thing basically walking around the room and you put your hand out and you see like scales come on your hand and it matches it perfectly. So you, you literally can't tell if it's reality or not. I'm like, oh my God, if I experience this, it makes so much sense why I just want to live in this world. I didn't get the idea of the metaverse and living in virtual reality until I saw this. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense why Facebook was willing to take that huge uh, multi-billion dollar risk to get into it. But uh, he's basically saying, I took one uh, supposed risk by supporting someone that wasn't the popular person in Silicon Valley to support. And I got ousted by this small majority, including Jason Calacanis, who literally kicked me when I was down. And he likes to virtue signal being this person that is pro founder. And that's because you want to attract founders. And he's like, at my weakest point, he wanted to kill me. So it's like, uh, it was actually kind of crazy too. After the, uh, after he did this whole spiel, Jason's like, I was wondering why it was so hard to get you to this event. And it's like, yeah, cause he fucking hates you with the passion. And the, you could sense it in his voice. He's like emotional, but it's like hatred pure hatred for this man. It's like, oh my God, I, I, the whole room didn't know how to respond because it's literally up until that point. It's like, this is an amazing event. Like everyone's stoked. We just had Elon Musk. Like, wow, wow, wow. And he's like, fuck this guy. And my opinion was like, we experienced that when we had our own podcast on Colin and uh, Friedberg and Sachs joined the room and then Jason joined the room and we tried to participate because it was our podcast and I don't know if he knew that but he came in and just shut us down immediately he's like mute yourselves who do you think you are just go back to price gouging your clients it's like dude we've been doing free clips for like a year for you guys and you're fucking coming shit on us so it's, I mean and I've listened whatever. to it a couple we, times we it's, it. it's it's near impossible to tell what of that was a joke and what was serious but, but like then whichever way it swings it's then there was another event with Colin. There was, uh, they were supposed to like thank the whack pack and they didn't show up for the first 40 minutes and they showed up drunk and they're like, uh, thanking us. But then I don't know, Nick says something and Jamal's like, basically shut up, Nick. You're not part of the besties. You're in the whack pack. And I was like, ah, come on, dude. Like, why are you going to do that? Um, so I just think their ego makes them want to virtue signal. And then we see the true side of them when no one's really looking. And, uh, so that's why I was like, Oh my God, you're, you're speaking to me. Like I was so stoked. I'm like, okay, you're taking the risk and calling this person out. And no one would do that. People are used to calling people out behind their backs, but he did it on the biggest stage possible. 
Um, so we're going to see if they release the actual tapes. I don't even know if they will. But uh, just complete shock and awe. Carpet bombed the whole event, but in a good way. Because then right after, they go into their little huddle uh, on stage and just break everything down. Want to talk about that? Um, before the Andrew part, what was so beautiful about it was this was like the thesis of the All In podcast. It's like, can we have difficult right. conversations, debate openly with passion, um, not take things personally and come out of that like better? Tim Urban talked about this later, this like idea of high rung politics, which which maybe we'll get into. But to then actually see them sit on stage and frankly, like Jason, who was blindsided, sucker punched because he's backstage, he can't defend himself, handled it with a, a pretty decent level of grace. That was interesting. And I think what Friedberg said best was like, J. Cal, first of all, you got to be nicer to people. But J. Cal and Palmer, like, I don't care what you guys are talking about. What I do want to highlight is the fact that Palmer, that was incredibly courageous and brave and not, like you're saying, not a lot of people in tech are willing to do that. Ryan Breslow is kind of doing this on Twitter by by sticking up to the the mob. Um, but yeah, it was it was a pretty emotional moment, actually. Kind of brought well, a tear to my eye. I, I didn't even remember this call in thing until you told me after. Uh, and then because it was more directed at you and that relatability made it even even that much more real for me. I mean, I, I think I felt it. But what's funny is Steph Smith from The Hustle, uh, now a 16 Z, she happened to see me or us standing and clapping and she like commented after like oh i get why because he did this to you and i'm like oh yeah that's right like, i had forgotten about that I just oh felt like, interesting i, I wasn't even deep? consciously think that i'm like oh that's badass calling him out because i don't know uh, intuitively i knew he did the same to us um and he was saying too like he was the black sheep of silicon valley so luckily he sold his company for several billion dollars so he he had that much money to start his his next company uh, Andrew, but it wasn't hard. Like even being a billionaire and having all this expertise in the field, people didn't want to fund him and having a team from Palantir. It's like, no one wanted to touch him. It's like, but also if, if I wasn't successful in selling to Facebook, like I'd be dead. And most founders in my position, I was lucky would be dead because of people like Jason. Correct. And the small guys like us, we couldn't stand up to Jason when he did that. So Palmer's in this interesting spot where he's made it, he's okay, he's 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 done his time. Coming out of it on the other side, he's able to stand up to someone like Jason. There are a lot of founders, maybe, that he's squashing that never make it to that point. Right. Yeah, so it was, it was nice speaking up for the, the little guy. Well, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the I room know. was, the room was uh, just... I don't know a saying for it, but he got a standing ovation and, uh, you know, Jason kind of apologized on stage. They hugged it out. It was kind of well, like a non-apology, you know, like, I'm sorry if I felt, I'm sorry way. if you took that the wrong way. Yeah. I'm sorry if you felt that way. It's like, dude, Todd would say that to people. Cause it's like the higher value thing. Like you're not admitting you're, it's like, dude, fuck off. It's like you objectively shit on him at his lowest point and his family. He's like, uh, you can attack my business. Like, I can get over that. Like you probably should be supportive of people starting important companies and doing important innovations. But when you attack me personally and my family, it's like what kind of sick, twisted human being would do that at my lowest point? So, uh, and it's like, I don't know. I texted you this yesterday. I'm like, I'm just going to tell people I voted for Trump. Like if you, if you hear that and you disqualify that person, I guess it's using the heuristic that I like to use. So it's kind of, I guess I'm being, uh, What's that called? Hypocritical. But like, if you hear that and you can't be like, oh, maybe like there could be a reason outside of just like hating black people that you'd vote for Donald Trump. Then I, it's like nice to have a conversation with that person. But I even like I told you at the event that night, I was talking to someone I'm like we don't have LinkedIn or anything or like I don't want to get someone's phone number. So I'm like, hey, what's your Twitter? I'm like, oh, I'll follow you, but you probably don't want to follow me because I, I, I'm Republican. I'm like she said that right yeah and I'm like I'm like <laughs> hey half my family is like I, I I'm cool with it like I'm probably more Republican than anything but it's like it's just funny that people preface that without even knowing anything about me they're like most likely he's not gonna like my tweets I'm like because hey, I'm of can we go to Tim Urban 
Yeah, well, what's kind of funny is there was a talk in between Palmer and Tim Urban. I blacked that whole thing out. I was in shock for like 30, 40 minutes. Yes. I feel bad for Adina has sweet or something was talking about the housing market. She I mean, she comes on after Palmer Lucky just drops the bomb. The room is in an uproar. Um, a good one, a, a cheerful one. And she's like, she did honestly a wonderful job of managing the crowd. She came out, like made a joke about it and then like had the entire crowd take a breath together before she could start her thing. That's tough to follow up. That's really yeah. tough to follow up because everyone's trying to decompress. Like it was stressful being there and you're trying to decompress during her talk on the housing market. She had a great company. She's the founder of uh, Divi. They actually... Um, help people secure mortgages through like you know some d to c uh web thing pop we could hey, get a house on divi i don't want a house i don't believe in ownership uh well then no you didn't listen to her up. talk you didn't listen to her talk she, i had no idea either. The, i was just yeah jotting notes the whole time um there's a correlation right, you, you talk about house Urban. ownership there's a correlation between house ownership and net worth and it's pretty obviously stark. yeah i don't have money to buy a house so why would i buy a house correct divvy correlation um, is easy. tim urban tim urban tim urban tim urban this is one of the things i was looking forward to most so tim urban i, I didn't because i hate politics and this stuff so my instinct oh. i like tim urban i'm just like uh i've seen his blog i didn't know what he was going to talk about. about political sphere and discourse like that yeah so he well is there a tagline for wait, but why? Like a, a motto? No. Oh. He, he, like, he uses stick figures and storytelling to boil down really complex ideas. Um, the first one I read was The Tail End, like maybe 15 years ago, about how you should spend more time with the people you love, friends and family. Because, like, after high school, you know, you're in the tail end of your time together with those people. Look it up. Um... What do you want to talk about with this talk? Do you want to go through the whole thing or just takeaways? Uh, what what stands out? To, one, his talk, his talk is like any other talk there is. And if you've seen his TED talk, which I don't know how many views, maybe like tens of millions of views, one of the most popular TED talks of all time. Uh, he's talking about procrastination. procrastination. And uh, like, I don't know, the, I forget what he calls the monkey in your head, but it's like the short-term gratification monkey or something like that. And it's like, I don't know. He just visualizes and creates, takes abstract ideas and just makes them into funny visuals that we can all remember and grasp. So compare him to any of the prior presentations where it's a PowerPoint, a lot of text, a few pictures, uh, poor, like what's in it for me as the audience member. He comes in and he's like, okay, this abstract topic of uh, polarization and how to have proper debate between different thinkers. It's like, how do you how do you explain what's been happening where like supposedly people argue on Twitter all the time and we all live in our bubbles and like what's happening and uh, there are some people that say like thought provoking things and some dumb things it's like it's just a weird ecosystem so he tries to distill it down um, and I think like the number one thing is he doesn't have text on screen like first thing it's just all his stick figure drawings that are funny it's like right off the bat. How do we pretend to be these adults? And he has like a, a stick figure that says, I am an adult. It's like, okay, that, that's just kind of funny already. He's like, how can we claim to be that? But when I look at America, I see this. And it's a kid crying on the ground with an ice cream cone that just uh, broke. It's like, oh, oh, that's that's just, that is what we are in the last couple of years, how we seem to behave. So immediately you remember that and you're like, okay, this is a funny conversation. I want to pay attention. Um, you care about it more, so you, maybe you want to break down, like, what stuck out stuck out to you, because maybe you see it in your family and stuff like that. Even yeah. Whatever. So then, then he goes in to start talking about polarization, and I got to do this with no notes. But he brings up a spectrum, and it's kind of like the electromagnetic wave spectrum. It's it's two D. It's one axis, like from zero to whatever. And on the left, you have your left. On the right, you have your right. Right? And he's like, all these people are arguing. But that's not the full story. There's actually a y-axis to this spectrum. And what was on the y-axis? Conviction? Well, yeah, so he's going 1D to 2D. And so he's talking about 
Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 1D. I th- no, it's like thinking quality. I forget what he termed it. It's the ladder. I don't know. It's like high rung. Oh, yeah, it was something ladders. Sure, sure. Right, it's, so it's basically on, like, yeah. On the x-axis, you have left to right, which is what everyone thinks is the only thing we're talking about. And then on the y-axis is, yeah, like quality of thought or ladder rungs for what it's worth. And he goes into this talk about dividing these things between low rung politics and high rung, high rung politics. And high rung is like this incredibly impassioned um, left versus right, my ideals versus your ideals, but the difference is it's positive sum. A, a high rung leftist and a high rung right thinker come out of that, you know, they disagree about how we're going to get somewhere, but they, you know, positive sum agree on where we need to go. And then he says low rung politics, which is what most people are engaged in right now, is like political Disney World. And in political Disney world, it's just like, uh, it's all us versus them. Good characters versus bad characters. Heroes Hero versus, versus villains. Villain. Hero yeah. versus villain. Um, and I don't know, the, the, the beautiful thing well, is every step of the way, he commands your attention so well. I, like, do you think anyone in the crowd disagreed with him? I don't think you could. Well, one, because we like to, he's like, most of the people here think you're the top left, as in the the clear high rung thinker, probably on the blue side, like the, the left side. Yeah. But, uh, and you, prior to this conversation, probably thought you're more in line with just everyone on the left, including the low rung left people. But that's probably untrue. You probably have a lot more in common with the high rung right, as in like, what I like to think of myself probably, or at least I don't think I'm far right, but like high rung people, high rung people versus being the same color. It's like, we should look more on like finding those people and having those people around us because that's where the actual discussions are. Because right now, the way everyone treats it when you're a low rung thinker is, hey, my ideas, my beliefs are a baby. And anytime you attack, you're attacking my baby. And look, it's crying, you're hurting a baby, you're criminal, you're evil, you're Hitler. It's like, that's how they treat everything because who would attack a baby? Versus the high rung thinkers, they treat their ideas like a robot. You ever see those like uh, robot battles, uh, little cage matches things? Like that's what it kind of is. Yeah, shit like that. It's like you're trying to build the best robot, but you don't know what parts work the best. And you're like actively trying to see how they fit and how they perform. And it's like you're detached. It's like the idea itself. And you're just on the sidelines outside of the ring, just observing. So when someone attacks what you believe, you don't take it personally because it's it's your robot and you're just trying to build the best robot and that's what sticks with me is like oh now i visualize like i want to build a robot i don't want to treat it like a baby every time uh there's some disagreement and ideas shoot i just had a really good one about the robot and the baby i lost it pop it's gonna come back to me oh it's so important hey give me a second give me a second it's gone. Onward. Ah. Onward and upward. Onward and upward. Uh, there's always hope. Well, Dude, I'm trying to machine. think of anything else. Oh, I, I don't got know. it. Wait, wait. Yeah. The checklist. Okay, wait. It's coming to me. It's coming to me. Oh, the beautiful thing about high rung. Because you're, you, you are separating the person from your beliefs, which is a machine. When you meet a high rung political thinker or a high rung thinker, and you hear that they voted for Trump, or you hear their stance on guns, you are not able to figure out their stance on abortion, for instance, uh. or what they think about education. It doesn't line up like that. Because high rung thinkers are, are independent thinkers in some sense. And I think of myself this way. It's like, there are beliefs, conservative beliefs I have, and then also really liberal ones. And you can't pin me to either side, really. He said, that's indicative of high rung. Now in low rung politics, when you hear one belief of, say, somebody's views on abortion, now you can line them up in their entire blue or right part of the spectrum, mm. left or right. And the low rung thinkers, um, I think Naval talks a lot about this, but like if you know one of their beliefs, you know the entire checklist of their beliefs because they right. fall neatly into uh, the one side. Got right. it. 
That was nice. That's such a great point that I forgot about. And, and I kind of want to do that thing. as a like, test. His visual is amazing. We can, you can literally, we, we could do it. Just go through the checklist, like with our friends. But that was my problem with Brown is I'm like, I came in. I mean, everyone wants to say they're a high rung thinker, but like, I kind of like foot flopped in between things, but there are very rarely people that I saw foot flop at Brown. It's more like they come in and yeah, you could guess what they believe on anything. Uh, so like, for example, uh, I don't know, take my cases. Like now listening to Palmer, I'm like, oh, I'm more pro defense than before. Before I'm like, ah, fuck war. But now I'm like, oh, if we want to prevent, uh, are you, are you there? I think I lost my Opal. <laughs> they gave me a message. Okay. I'm here. Palmer. Uh, basically like if you're changing your ideas, I, I think I forget who says it, but it's like. Uh, strong ideas loosely held, strong beliefs loosely held, whatever it is. It's like, oh, I I thought, fuck all this war spending that we're doing. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Then Palmer's like, oh, no, prevention is important because that's what keeps us safe and that allows our economy to flourish internally. I'm like, oh, okay, it makes sense spending a lot on there. Now I'm more pro-war than before. Or immigration. I, I hear Elon Musk say, no, we could 10x the size of the U.S. That's not a problem. Like, we're going to have abundant electricity if we just add a little corner of Texas to the solar grid and have that. And it's like, oh, okay, now it's great that we're taking in people. Like, especially smart people, we should get as many as possible. So I, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I, I flip-flop on, I like, change. taxation all the time. Um, yeah. And what, My, what Tim said is going on right now, do you want to talk about the colored brains? Because this is kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, I love that. Okay. You need yeah, to. You really awesome. need to watch what he's talking about because – like we're not even doing the logical steps he's taking that well. But right. what he said is going on right now is there is a flare up of low rung politics because of the pandemic, because of social media. He put up this amazing graph where it's like people like to think they've curated their social media to be moderate, centrist. Well, Could even you said that and I'm like, dog, we're in a bubble. Yeah, no chance. So he puts up this real data of um, social media posts and it's like, if you're on the left, you're primarily seeing things retweeted by the left. And it's like this super dense cloud of blue. Same thing right. on the right. And that's a real graph. Uh, there's very little going on in the middle. Right. And I lost my point. So that's sick, well, dude. Yes. It's all Gives right. you, you an opportunity you to take it. Uh, but what was cool there is uh, we'll talk about the debate that they had after. But it's like we did have people that could separate their ideas from themselves. And that's important to to just have discussions. I don't think the debate actually worked, but uh, no. it's it's just cool to be in a room where I couldn't guess what people believe. Or it's like Elon saying, oh, uh, I voted Democrat all this time. Or like anyone on stage, it's like, oh, I, yeah, I, I have these beliefs. And it's like, oh, that surprised me. I wouldn't have guessed that. And it's like, oh, why am I guessing? Because I think they're a low wrong thinker, but they're high. So they like, they take all the facts in and just figure out what they think is true. Um, same with Sachs, who's like labeled the conservative, has probably voted more Democratic, raised more money for Democrats. I don't know about now, but like in his lifetime. Yeah. It's like really. Well, Democrats have really gotten funky. pretty crazy. Well, this is the idea, right? Okay. So why has, uh, I, I guess both sides have, but I just like, I'm more offended by, I think the left side, because I was on their side and then they pushed me out. Or like, I'm like, hey, I, I was a fan and then you fucking. Uh, like it, well, it's never I think ending Elon, in terms of how far you can go. Elon, I think the left pushing out Elon and Joe Rogan, huge mistake. Right. right. Huge like, mistake. Uh, Joe Rogan voted for Bernie Sanders. The most <laughs> left uh, candidate we've ever had in the history of the United States. And you're saying he's right wing radical? It's like, what are you even talking about? And so what I liked about going back to Tim Urban and his talk, he's like, okay, Here's how the world works. We have all these different brains, different interpretations of the world, different colors. That's how he represents it. Just a bunch of minds on screen, a bunch of different brains. It's like, what happens though, is we all talk with this same color. Let's call it orange. So you see all these orange colors going in between. Why? Because if you speak out, speak your the color of your brain, well, something bad happens. Because all we see, like when... He explains it so well. I feel bad. I'm not doing it justice. But like when you're talking, 
Like there are certain safe things to say and certain non-safe things. Or like you have to nuance the shit out of it to make it like acceptable. Like saying, I don't know, you're, I don't know, like slavery was bad. Uh, like everyone's gonna, I don't know uh, how to explain this, but like basically well, take the safe thing to say. Everyone's going to default to the safe because you don't want to get fired from your job, put your life at risk or whatever it might be. So you're everyone's going to say the safe thing. So now you just see this world of the safe thing, which might not be the right thing uh, to say. And so everyone seems like they have orange, but then one person speaks up, deviates, and you're looking around and like, hey, they're not orange. Why aren't they orange? Oh, fuck, Wait, so before that, back. yeah, 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 before that. It's hard. It's hard without the graphic. How the fuck did he do it's this? It's amazing, though. It's amazing, though, that we can pretty much recall it. So there's a screen with green, red, blue, orange, yellow, purple brains everywhere. Right. And they're kind of loosely connected in networks, like your neighbors, your family, your community, whatever. What starts to happen is some thought, like you're saying, becomes the right thought or the liberal thought or the woke thought. And now... All of these brains that are all multicolored, he draws an orange circle around them. So you can still see all these multicolored brains, but there's this veneer of orange around all of them. Everyone's talking about the thing in your community. It might be, you know, we should be pro-choice. But he's like, but then it goes a step further. Because when you are your own brain and you see these orange veneers everywhere, everything everything is now right. opaque. And the whole you screen turns You can't see their orange. brain. You can only you see cannot, what they're saying. So now correct. everyone seems like their brain is orange. So now I'm a blue brain in a sea of orange. And you start to get really confused. It's like, oh, all these people are talking about this thing. Am I the, am I the only one that, that thinks otherwise? When in fact, everyone's still red, green, orange, blue, purple, you know, all these things. Um, and then, so all these high-rung thinkers end up becoming um, quieter more muted, more cowardly, because you see what happens when you speak up and express something that isn't the common orange thought in your community, for instance. Well, that was, uh, take Jason and Sax on stage. They had a joke and it's like, Sax was angry about like Jason always trashing him, trashing him. And Jason's like, yeah, well, how much more exposure have you gotten from the podcast? Like how many more deals have you done? And Sax is like, probably 50% less. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, because he's just shitting on him and no one wants to like be associated with the right wing guy because that's just like, oh, that's that's the I'm bad sure it gets more deal flow publicly. though. It was I know joke. he probably does, but the the joke landed because it does ring true. It's like Palmer is the one person to speak up who says something that isn't orange. Now the whole world is looking around, it's like, he's not orange. I mean, I'm I'm not really orange too, but I don't I don't wanna like take that risk and be the black sheep and then get attacked and literally killed, slaughtered. Uh, so that's that's how we get into this world. And that's why I like when you have billionaires come in and they're like, hey, I don't care about money or people or anything. I already have my family. I'm just going to speak my mind and what I think is true. And then what they're saying matches the color of their brain. But that's so rare. Um, like and, Palmer, and for example, with defense, if you ask, he talks about like defending America or Often it's like in the attack too, but whatever, like supporting defense. If you ask, say, 10 uh, smart people, Silicon Valley, eight, eight out of the 10 will be like, hey, it's important that America is the best superpower. Like it's important that we run the world rather than China or Russia or, I don't know, uh, Saudi Arabia, whoever it might be. So they agree with that. But then it's like, well, would you hypothetically work for a company like that? Still, the majority say, yes, I would work for a company like that. But then the one out of 10 that's super against anything the, the U.S. does that's like imperial or like trying to take over, they're the loudest voice. And the reason why they get their voice echoed, one, there's like the silent majority that just like, they don't feel strongly enough to like overshadow them. But, but two, if you're at a Google, Google doesn't really want to take that reputational risk of supporting defense because they had a contract. I think it was a, uh, it was something like Maven, actually the the name of it. But they were supposed to work with the Department of Defense, and there were loud voices within Google that were like, "We don't want to do this. We refuse to sign up for this." And it's like, "Well, you don't have to, but whatever." But Google shut it down. They terminated that contract because it'd be like one percent of their total revenue. Like, 
we're not going to risk uh, a bunch of issues within the company. Plus, who knows, like who's buying our product that now no longer is going to want to buy our product. Uh, they could lose 10% of their revenue just on supporting the government. And it's like throughout history, when the fuck was that normal? Like if you said the top tech companies weren't in favor of supporting the government for the entire history of the United States, that'd be ludicrous. Can you imagine just being like, no, I don't support the country where we're in. It's like, well, even Palmer was nice. talking about uh, atomic bomb research, weapons research at Stanford before World War II. Like right. that was a very in thing to do. Naval says too, um, and Tim touched on this, but the the left won the culture war. Now they're running around the streets shooting all the survivors. Hey, I almost lagged out of that one. Got nervous. Almost Dude, lagged it's, out. It's crazy. How um, so yeah, I mean the 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 left wokeism generally dominates culture, and so that's how they're able to kind of permit these mind viruses tim says the answer is is leadership it's high rung thinkers becoming outwardly spoken like what brian armstrong is doing at coinbase what uh, netflix has recently done with the backlash against dave chappelle it's like putting a foot down saying i'm a blue brain uh well that's one of the colors i'm a green brain you know i'm not going to stand for this and then it's still Yes, dude, another chance. It slowly starts to dissipate. The mind viruses slowly start to dissipate. So leadership is is the answer, he says. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah, leadership. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that is like the Brian Armstrong. Uh, yeah, Apple well, is also cracking down. Yeah. And I think, I think Elon has never, it, it's, this doesn't have seemed to be a question at Elon's companies, this like, wokeism because he's just always been so like we make goods and services that do useful things we are net useful like this isn't about politics companies don't right. exist to have a political like, stance we do crazy useful is things for the world that you you as a billionaire donate nine thousand dollars to an anti-hillary campaign and hillary wasn't the person that won so it's like he was technically on the correct side <laughs> and you get kicked out of your company because like he wasn't voicing that internally i assume he wasn't like making it public it just came became public and the news fucking uh like uh not hawks but they just attacked him um so it's, it's all interesting and then we kind of see like the rubber meet the road right after tim his awesome presentation there's a debate between what is it antonio garcia martinez glenn, and, and glenn, glenn greenwald. greenwald right and i guess they're debating the war in the Ukraine, which uh, I don't really follow, I don't care too much about, but just from an outside perspective, I'm like, oh, no wonder debate doesn't work because this is just a shitty debate. Well, it was and, a low-rung debate. That's what it right. was. Like, Antonio had just gone to Ukraine. He had seen it. He had been there firsthand. So Ukraine to him is this baby. Uh, what the U.S. is doing, our involvement with the war is a baby. For Antonio. And anything Glenn says is literally Glenn kicking his baby in front of him to play on the Tim Urban. Same right. for Glenn Greenwald. Um, he, yeah, and it got really emotional well, and it was really interesting. Yeah, I'm like, this is by definition low rung because it is emotional. You're supposed to not have emotions in a debate. And like, I was trying to think of if I were in it. Like, basically, they just had rants for, like, five minutes talking literally to the audience, not really at each other. And I'm like, I I consider a debate who's going to change their mind, who's going to be open-minded about the whole situation. Like, the nice thing about the podcast with All In is, like, sometimes they do change their minds. Or there's at least the idea that they're open to it. But here, it's like, they were just digging a deeper stance because it's theater. And I'm like, oh, I get why people like Young Spielberg, he texted, he's like, oh, that was an amazing debate. And I'm like... That was a shit debate. No <laughs> one's changing their mind from that. It's just like confirmation bias and just attacking each other for no reason. I'm like, this well, is from weird. Like, well, like Glenn I think was pulling comes... out his phone and his computer to like find stats. It was just weird. It was weird, and it was interesting right after Tim Urban. But I see it as no one at Brown, for example, 
ever learned how to debate properly or like have, I don't even like the word debate. I think that frames it wrong. Have a discussion. It's like no one knows how to talk to someone that doesn't believe the same thing at the we didn't have time to. that they do. Like to right. play on a Jonathan Haidt coddling of the American mind, it's like we had so much parent involvement, guardian involvement, that when things arose, we would go to a parent and the parent would solve that problem. That's like a multi-generational historical reason for that. Well, problems but, didn't arise. That's the thing. Because everyone, like if you had to do an exercise, it was always maybe a teacher would try and play devil's advocate, but they really believe the same thing as the students. Or at least everyone's talking orange. Whereas like, even I would write essays that were orange just because I'm like, I'm going to get a better grade on it if I write it orange versus if I take a hard stance on what I actually believe. So it's like, no one is actually defending. It's all like theoretically defending and they don't actually believe that because everyone's just pretending to be on the same side because it, it is risky. Like literally at Brown, if you heard someone was on the like Republican committee or whatever that group was, that shit spread like wildfire. Yeah, Everyone's crazy. Like, Did you hear this person's a Republican? It was fucking black sheep. So no one would take that risk. I I kind of at the end, luckily my my public speaking class that I talk about, it was like take the unpopular opinion and talk about it. Actually, this is kind of funny. It just happened in the news, but I was like, women deserve to be paid less in professional sports. That was my opinion. It's like, I honestly believe that. So I could defend it pretty easily because I'm like, hey, sport, it's a game. It's all about getting eyeballs on the sport. They get fewer eyeballs, less valuable eyeballs. So they should be paid less. But then, I don't know, a day ago, I saw on the news, it's like the US, I don't know, the Olympic team, I'm gonna, women's and men's team, the salaries are equal. Like, all right, I guess you can do that. But then you're just gonna see like, uh, like the competition to be a professional male athlete is so much higher too. It's like, it's almost unfair to the men because they had to overcome all this risk and now you're going to be pitted. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance there. There, that's, there was something there. Like, I don't know the, the women have a much higher winning record, like a bunch of things than the men's team. That's kind of shitty. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. No one's watching a women's game. Yeah. Like my question to it. the group it's like, who here has been to a professional sports game that's male? It's like, everyone raises their hand. Who's been to one that's female? One person raised their hand. It's like, that's why there's more demand for this thing than for that thing. So there's more money there. It's like, whatever. But the idea, I couldn't talk about that until there's like a forum where it's acceptable to have these. And so people uh, kept bringing up these points and they're like, Good points, for example. Yeah, how was that received in class? Was there a healthy debate? Uh, or, or was it a Q&A session? Yeah, I mean, they, it took to the point of the leader. It took the leader saying, this is okay. This is like your safe debate space. So we're yeah. asking you to take the hard stance. So it'd be silly if I took the easy stance of like, women should be paid the same. Like everyone already, uh, at least their orange thinking agrees that. It's like, yeah, pay equality is nice. But it's like... If I was shit at a job, like uh, kind of one of the arguments is like, okay, let's just have soccer. It's just soccer. And whoever is on the top teams get paid the most. No woman would ever make it to pro sports because it's just like their bodies aren't meant for being the best there. And I'm sure culturally it's like frowned upon, but it's also like physically. Um, like take the Serena Williams, she gets smashed by someone that's ranked like 800 in tennis uh, on the men's side. So it was just cool that the leader was responsible there. I even changed my beliefs on like fat people, for example, and what beauty standards are. Cause someone was like, Hey, fat is beautiful. My gut is like, no, it's not. I'm not into that. But then they showed historically over time, like from the, I don't know, 1800s through today, the beauty standard has changed a lot. Like th this was a hot woman 200 years ago. This was status was someone that's fat. And like, we see that cause resources were scarce. And it's like, you're just believing today because resources Italians. are abundant. So it's like that, that doesn't matter. You'd rather have someone fit. But then you see Greek gods and like they're fucking ripped. It's like, I think maybe that's the objective, but at least now I'm more open-minded to that, I guess, because I'm awesome. Um, so I guess uh, there was that debate. Who knows if it was actually good. Hopefully people get better at debating because that was like no one changed their mind because of it. I like the debates where it's like, where is the other side right? Like if you had to, you ask like, 
stone right uh, strong, strong man their argument and just like argue for the other side uh in an honest way that'd be nice uh anything else for debate for debate no that was a shit show then um nothing really for this next woman claire she's uh i don't even know the company really i guess they're the biggest real estate company in china or the world i don't really know what they are oh i so claire's talk was interesting because it was very pro china it was like you it it was high rung you know like everything is us versus them us versus china that's our enemy and she's like no here's really awesome things happening in real estate with my company in china uh you know, she's talking about using software and buildings, like having a centralized WeChat that you can communicate with everyone and pay for things in your building, all these all these things. And she was really optimistic about China and how we need to work together. And that was kind of refreshing, actually. The problem that I had was I didn't get the why I should care about this until the end. She's just like, China has WeChat. China has all these smart buildings. I'm like, all right, why the fuck does Dylan in Rhode Island care about that? It's like, from the start, if it's like, China's doing technology amazing. This is what we can use in America so that it's relevant to us. This is how we can work together. Like, oh, oh, that would be nice. I think Chamath asked her about, um, like, what are the rankings of government in China? How do these projects get pushed through? Is there a lot of bureaucracy like in California? And she was like, there are, there are levels within um, d- different governances in, in China, and they 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 run these communities like startups. So there will be a leader in a community. They have KPIs, metrics that, you know, their higher ups are looking for in their community in terms of buildings made, uh, parks created, uh, cleanliness, like all these things. And you have to hit those objectives. And it was interesting because it's like, wow, government in the US, it's like, there's no North Star within each state, within the federal government, like there's no KPIs. Right. It's like, that's probably how they're so efficient and how they're growing and they're growing together. Yeah. This is, this is where, uh, Palmer talking about defense. It was interesting. It's like, okay, you have the sort of dictatorships in China or a Russia and they can basically tell the whole economy, Hey, we're just going to focus on defense. They're going to take the smartest talent and just put them on uh, drone automations. Like they can do that. Whereas here, it's like, we have to hope it's the current thing to care about in this war in the Ukraine so we can spend more time in defense and people care about it. It's like, the the more effective short-term strategy is just be a dictator because you know what's important and you should tell your whole economy to do that. So we're battling, like, long-term, we don't want a dictatorship, but it's a lot more effective at, like, winning wars and being the superpower. Same thing there. It's like, if they have their five-year plan in China and it's it's a well-thought-out plan actually a lot more effective to be the dictator you're gonna get leaps and bounds uh in terms of just a better economy especially when when you change presidents all the time in democracy the problem is you don't know what to believe there's uncertainty like trump you don't know how to behave because he might have some random ass law versus if you have a five-year plan it's very clear what the future is going to be so there's less uncertainty uh and each community literally has a five-year plan what's the whole country and then it, it trickles down. Fascinating. The whole country does. Yeah, yeah. Trickle down economics. <laughs> what else Love you got, NPC. Pop? Uh, last, last thing. Hour. Well, two last things. One, Antonio Gracias, uh, who he was unknown to me. I guess he's in Chicago. Supporter of SpaceX, Tesla from the early days. Big dude. Uh, not like important dude. And... Uh, What's interesting is just like people are so boring. I was just like, this guy is fascinating, but he's boring as shit. At least when he was giving his majority talk, uh, when they started to open up in Q and A after, it's like, oh, he had some more life and he made some jokes and he was actually funny. I'm like, why couldn't you just appear to care more about your answers? Because like, if you think you're excited and care, it's like, oh, I. If you're expending energy into something, I should expend energy and understanding what you you care about. Um, he just didn't do much of that, but I'm like, you're fascinating. That's, that's really too bad. Um, I don't know if you had anything to say about him. Well, it's, it's, that's kind of like our mission is just these worlds, these industries, like they just take themselves way too seriously. Right. Why can't everything be a little bit more informal, personable, Q&A style, goofy? 
that's why I thought Elon's talk was great. He he kind of broke down and was that more informal. Well, he is in in a lot of respects, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was basically it for the Q&A. Q&A is shitty. I hate how they do them where it's like whoever is first to the mic stand and gets to ask a question. Somehow that's the most important thing because you fucking, you were close to the mic. Um, I would like some sort of voting system where it's like you can see a bunch of top questions and see which one you'd like to hear most. Uh, whatever it is, but most of them were like stuff you could just find out versus like getting banter. I want like banter provoking conversations. Like let me hear some stories of behind the scenes. Luckily, now we get invited to the events so we can kind of tell the stories of what happens at Sack's 50th birthday party, things like that. And that's also, oh, yesterday when I'm like, oh, okay, we went to the summit, cool event, but now we're getting invited to like actual cool, cool events that most people can't get into. Why are we still like struggling to make decent money? We're objectively going to be the poorest people at this event. Like, <laughs> luckily, they're paying for our $2,000 a night hotel, which is like the cheapest room. Uh, but <laughs> God, I hope. <laughs> um, but it's like, why are we why are we in this room? Like, why can't we make more money? And then I, I got into like, oh, maybe we have some agency that appeals to startups. No, startups, they don't have the money. VCs have the actual money. Let's do a VC like agency. I'm like, ah, I don't really like the agency. Then I circled back to like, let's just be the wait, but why the Tim Urbans of their boring as shit ideas that they can't tell. Like, let's just retell those ideas in a more fun way. Um, and that's just what we're known for whenever we get introduced at parties or like, it's like, oh, you got to meet Henry and Dylan. They just make nerdy stuff cool. Like it's, it's crazy. Like, wait, but why? That's for millennials. This is for Gen Z because it's video first. Like, ah, okay, I like that. That's what we're jamming on. Hey, an hour and 10 minutes. Hey, Pop. I'm coming back. I'm coming back next week with the giggles. I'm still, I'm still trying to take it all. I know. In. I I felt weird. I, I didn't like my. It's, it. A lot of the time, I don't like my own personality. It's kind of weird. I see myself. I'm like, ah. that's why when I want to stop the podcast, I'm like, I don't like who I am right now. <laughs> I don't like. Because you're well, yeah, one because I had a mental deficiency, but uh. Hey, we might have a therapy session after this. We had some good talks. We had some good talks in Miami after these thought-provoking speakers. Well, I think the problem is when you care a lot, you lose the funny. I, I don't know what it is, but it's like, oh, uh, no funny. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm tired or if it's if it's the 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 topic. Like I, I think we're trying to transfer a lot of knowledge from the thing. Right. As opposed to going down a rabbit hole for something that's really goofy. But I'm also exhausted from the week. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe when there's too much to talk about. And with that. Easy with that. There's like, there's, like you said, there's so much information. Oh, this is one of the points from the, the conversations or the debate. So a debate, you have five minutes. It's like, let me squeeze as much into five minutes as possible. When what's better is be a smart thinker and just prioritize. Like We saw this a lot when you'd be giving a presentation in that presentation class I talked about. It's like, oh, you just start talking really fast because you want to fit in all your information, but then you lose everything. It's like, no, instead, just take the simple nuggets that you want everyone to leave with. It's like the way people think, the, the baby, the robot. Take those, tell those slowly in five minutes because... You don't need a page worth of content. You just need the one-liner that people are going to remember. So that's kind of like this. Like we had too much information. We tried to fit it all in rather than do the itinerary, which people don't care about most of the speakers in this conversation. It's like just take like the top three ideas and really talk about those in detail. I don't know. Or even just an episode on the Palmer Lucky event because that's going to come out on YouTube just an episode on the Tim Urban talk because that's going to come out on YouTube. Yeah. I don't know. This this whole world's kind of serious. Like, well, there are no giggly goos at these talks. I, there's, I don't know. We'll see because I want to do a Palmer Rocky episode. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But there's no like, there's no translating it into something that's funny. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a serious. Yeah, I don't know, dude. 
Maybe we just don't do event recaps. We just talk about people. <laughs> the, the Smart Nonsense podcast never records <laughs> again. We we just lost the giggles. <laughs> we go to one in-person event. Um, <laughs> Gardner Lou! Gardner